we go. All right, hello Internet, and welcome to uh, it's Pearls of Wisdom for October the 5th, uh, 2016. Uh, I am uh, back in the office after an overseas trip to Japan last week for the International Association for the Study of Pain meeting. Uh, fantastic Congress, lots of exciting things happening in the pain field in all sorts of different directions. Can't wait to see what uh, the Congress is going to look like in the next two or four years. I think we're going to see a lot of convergence between different fields of research, and uh, I'll talk more on that in, uh, in another vlog later on. But today, I am happy to be joined by Caitlin Turner, uh, who is a student uh, conducting her, or going through her thesis-based Master's of Science degree in clinical anatomy here at Western. And uh, Caitlin's got uh, a really interesting project uh, focusing on traumatic neck pain. Uh, we Whiplash, we'll call it, uh, for lack of a better term at the time being. And uh, so I've invited her here. I want to have her talk a little bit about uh, the work she's doing. I've been fortunate enough to, to work with her on this and sort of a supervisory role. Um, but this is definitely her baby. And so, uh, Caitlin, uh, tell me a little bit about what you saw clinically and why it is you're doing the work you're doing. Sure. So I had a client come in one day with a lot of pain around like the rib cage, which isn't necessarily supplied by the nerve we're looking at, but it started to make me think about different things because neck movement started to make that pain worse, which isn't quite your normal. Um, and breathing also really made that pain significantly worse. So this is a person who had a whiplash injury, we think. Yes. It's yep. reporting pain sort of around lower. Exactly, so cage. around like All right. hostile margin area. Um, and no real pain with any thoracic movement either. So mm -hmm. mainly just neck movement and deep breathing causing the pain. And with thoracic movement, pretty standard and normal. Hmm. So what I did, um, I started to think about the phrenic nerve. Just being in a clinical anatomy program, you start to think about things a little bit differently as you go back and kind of remember some of these things you, you forget about sometimes in your Stuff career. you learned as a student. Exactly. Right, right. Exactly. So I just, I just had a bit more of a creative brain that day. Um, so I laid her down and I had her take a really deep breath to see if it still was like that in supine, and it was. So then I started playing around with um, the areas that the phrenic nerve comes from, so C3, 4, 5. And if I got on C4 and just traction C3-4, um, her pain decreased when she took a deep breath. So we were like, okay, this... This again is the pain around the costal the margin area. The pain around like the costal margin area. Okay. So that started to go away as we started to play with the neck. So I continued along there and like the like paraspinal muscles along the, I believe she was... It was left, I can't remember which side it, it was at this point, but the paraspinal muscles along that side of the neck were like really taut, really, really tender. Um, mm -hmm. So we worked through those a little bit first just to kind of calm them down and be able to get to actual joint a little nicer. Um, and then we did some traction and then I had her breathe again and it had decreased the pain around here, but it wasn't gone yet. And we traction basically C3, 4, C4, 5 were our big ones that we went to and then um, I tried to nerve floss it because <laughs> I'm like this is what I would do with any other nerve so why so wouldn't I do. try with the diaphragm <laughs> so basically I put her in a little bit of like contralateral side flexion so that the nerve would have been on a bit of tension and then I did a cell and I had her deep breathe as I did the cell thinking that hopefully we were gonna pull the nerve down. A superior um, anterior lateral movement. Yes. Sir. Right, got superior it. Superior anterior lateral okay. movement got of C3 it. on C4. And then as you deep breathe, the diaphragm goes down. So it descends. And as it descends, because the phrenic nerve pierces it, it pulls the phrenic nerve down with it. So theoretically, it should pull the entire nerve and start to floss it through that area. We did this maybe eight times. And after that, pain around the rib cage was gone. So it started the thought process of, can we injure the phrenic nerve? If we do, how, how will we treat it? Where is it getting caught or adhered if, if it is getting injured? And then I hmm. met Dave. Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, I have to say what I love about that story is that I often say that my best research questions came from my clinical experiences, mm -hmm. right? I was a clinician for about eight years before I came back to academia. And this is another example here where mm -hmm. you saw something clinically, 
uh, you were uh, creative enough, you had your creative brain on that yep. day, enough to think, boy, there's something kind of weird going on here. Mm -hmm. And now you've decided to actually return to the hallowed halls of academia yep. and try and sort this out. So what have you been doing now to try and figure this all out? So basically what we've been doing is we already know like the path that the phrenic nerve travels. It's described in every anatomy book. Basically, there's a few articles online that also describe the path. So what we've been doing is we've done fresh cadavers. So they were frozen, but they haven't been embalmed yet. And then we've also done fixed cadavers. So they've been embalmed and the tissue's a little bit different. So we dissected through along the length of the nerve, basically from its roots at C3, 4, 5, down through the anterior scalene, posterior to the clavicle and first rib. And then as it passes down along the sides of the heart, beside like the lung until it pierces the diaphragm. Mm. So we followed this down and we're looking at spots in our dissection at where this nerve might get adhered most. So when it goes down the anterior scalene, it lies the muscle is posterior and then anterior to the nerve is going to be the prevertebral fascia, sorry. Um, and this fascia in the neck for the most part on most of the dissections that I've done was extremely taut. Um, and with almost everyone, not quite everyone, I'd say like 85% of my population, the nerve was actually bound to the fascia, not on the underlying muscles. So when I went to try and even mm. dissect the nerve out, it was really hard, like a couple bodies actually cut it and had to go start on the other <laughs> side, just because it was really hard to kind of pull that nerve out. So this was definitely a spot where just even in bodies that we don't know have had any neck injury, that nerve is already a little bit bound up mm. in that area. Um, and then as we continued down the path, another area where I found the nerve also got quite like adhered or bound up was where it travels in through the fascial sheath around the subclavian artery and vein. Right. Um, and to the point where I started playing around with, with where I cut first. So some people I would take the prevertebral fascia off first. Some people I'd go through like the fascial sheath around the vasculature and then I start pulling and playing with the nerve. And I found that if I left the prevertebral fascia on, it was a lot tauter, so it was a lot harder to pull that nerve. If I cleared out the like fascia of um, the fascial sheath around the vessels, it was easier to pull the nerve, um, but it was still hard to move it in general. So it didn't mm. have a lot of excursion. Um, and in people, one other thing we, I noted as well, in people that have had like some form or their cause of death was some form of cardiac condition, some of them, number one, the vasculature was really weak, but also the fascia was thicker around those vessels. So it was a lot harder to clean out. That nerve was a lot more tightly bound in through that fascial layer. Um, so it moved a lot, a lot less if I took this off and pulled it from up there. And so there's, just thinking of the anatomy now, mm -hmm. that you've gone through and you've really closely studied this course, there's certainly at least anatomical possibility that in some people, mm -hmm. after having experienced some kind of traumatic sort of neck, yep. you know, wiggling back and forth, um, may sort of be tractioning or somehow affecting Absolutely. that phrenic nerve. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to be clear, you're not trying to make the argument here that every person with a whiplash injury has a phrenic nerve problem, no. um, but that when you see people clinically who maybe are presenting with some sort of kind of weird symptoms, mm -hmm. you're talking about shortness of breath, you're talking about sort of costal margin or diaphragmatic pain, mm -hmm. um, that this might be a direction you start to look. And I think um, as we continue to develop our understandings of whiplash related problems, we have to recognize that there is still a biology here. That right. again, we're not saying that the entire um, phenomenon of whiplash associated disorder can be explained by any one process, whether it be a phrenic nerve problem, a facet joint problem, mm -hmm. a spinal cord related issue, um, but that as we start to look at some non-traditional areas of mm -hmm. potential sort of damage um, we might actually start to see sort of interesting things that we're not seeing on traditional x-ray or, or MR or things like that, which I think is really kind of important mm -hmm. and exciting. And in particular, what I think is really interesting is what you just said about people with cardiac-related problems. Right. That this might be, now you've got a patient uh, who was involved in a, in a motor vehicle collision, who's reporting now maybe increased shortness of breath, um, some diaphragmatic costal mm -hmm. margin issues. We've talked about maybe some shoulder, some kind yep. of diffuse shoulder pain that doesn't mm -hmm. 
may or may not be related to neck pain and has a cardiac problem, this might be now a direction we go. Mm -hmm. Of course, the next trick would be, what do we do about it? Right, yeah. <laughs> right? That's uh, the fun part. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the fun part. But I guess, you know, with, with any research program, you need to start somewhere. We first need to start by saying, yes, this is potentially an right. issue that we want to, uh, mm -hmm. to look at. Great. So how far along are you now with the project? So we've completed pretty much all of our dissection. So our goal was to do 10 embalmed, and we did two fresh frozen. So we have one more embalmed to complete. Great. Um, and then we've also created a survey to clinicians just to start seeing whether this is actually seen clinically or not. If, if we're inquiring about some of the symptoms that would go along with injury or damage to the phrenic nerve clinically, like you said, shortness of breath and, mm -hmm. and things like that, um, or increased shortness of breath. Sometimes two clients don't even know that this is an odd, odd right. symptom until, until right. you point it out and ask about it. So we've created a survey to do that, and then one of our next steps that we just started discussing was to actually start maybe getting some clients that have had whiplash injuries to fill out some form of survey or like mini assessment form in terms of where their pain is, what some of their symptoms are, um, so that we can kind of correlate back that back to them. So I mean, this is all very exciting, and I, what I love about this entire project is that it's it's taking what you learned as a student, mm -hmm. which yep. was actually turns out maybe some useful information, lo and behold, um, combine that with some clinical experience, mm -hmm. coming back and now actually doing an empirical study mm -hmm. on this, and not only that, but you're combining lab-based anatomical work with some clinical data and trying to bring exactly. it all together and sort of see from these different perspectives do things all sort of point in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very exciting. Um, yeah. I hope you all find that exciting as well. I can't wait to see the ongoing results of this. So, Caitlin, thanks for coming and chatting with me about today. Thank you.